I've worked many bars over the years in Ireland and in England. I got the idea of it because two of my brothers were already in the trade. As a young lad at night, I used to listen to them whenever they came home, telling stories about the things that had happened and the people that they met. To me, the stories were just mesmerizing, and I just thought I would love to try this. I always felt the buzz that they get off meeting people, the relationships, the companionships that they had made over the years. And from the first day I'd done it, I knew this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Joe was a fantastic barman. And he made, Joe gave you a comfortable feeling because you knew that he was looking out for you. He's a lovely man. He's a lovely man. He's very sincere, very honest, very respectful. First and foremost, I would say Joe's a people person. And Joe's whole attitude in life was make people happy. People can talk about great managers can do this and they can make cocktails and everything else. You can train anybody to do that. You can train anybody to be good at money and adding up and all that. What you can train people to do is to like people. I've had hundreds of people that work with me, not for me, with me. Whenever I'd done the interview, the first thing I asked them was, why would you like a bar job? And people would say, oh, I like the cocktails, Joe, or I'm good at making them, or I'm good at this, or I'm good at that. And I would say, I'll let you know, we have to interview more people. And then a young fellow would walk in, and I would say, why would you like to work in a bar? Well, Joe, I think I would like it because I like people. And I would say, start Monday. Well, I think what made Joe, uh, you know, such a great barman and, and why he was so loved. It's like, I remember the first time I came into Bennigan's, I came in, it was Friday evening, about five or six o'clock. But like the second I walked through the door, you had his full attention. He was chatting to you. He, was, he genuinely wanted to know about you. If Joe asked you, be it on the street, in the bar, or anywhere, and I asked you, how you doing? You know that actually means it. He's not just, he's not my teeth out. I was asked once, Joe, what was the best piece of information you ever got that helped you all the years that you worked in bars? It was my father who gave it to me. He gave all the boys one piece of information. He said, remember this, no matter who you meet, Treat them with respect. A lot of people, through the course of a day or a week or whatever, they tell you things. They tell you things about themselves and as, as the night wears on, they kind of leak information. People want to do that there if you're trusted. And uh, it's a great gift to be given by people. People tell barmen things that they won't tell their wives or their husbands or anything. They just, they don't. Because back to that old saying, you know, about the man at home when he was crying and his wife says, do much for me. He says, my barman doesn't understand me. Whenever people were even telling stuff, even if they were in company, and maybe they just wanted to get something on their chest or whatever, and there may have been some people that didn't agree with. But I just always try to install this thing. What you hear in here, what you see in here. When you leave in here, let it stay in here. You don't have to agree with what they say, but what you have to agree is, if it's bar them, they have a right to get it off their chest. And to me, that was, again, building relationships, just saying, you know, this isn't... We, don't, we just don't see a pound sign when you walk in here. Joe grew up in the Brandywell, like, quite a few years ago, and for the little that they had at that time, they would have had a lot of respect. They had a lot of respect for their neighbours and their community. And Joe would have grew up with that. Growing up in the Brandywell, I never really felt that we were, like, hard done by because anything that we had, we made the most of it. I know where it's come from. I was actually born in the same house as Joe Levin in 23 Randwell Avenue. That's where, that's where I was born and grew up. And you could see it back then, the camaraderie in the area. So it was great growing up in that atmosphere. It was like a family atmosphere and a street. Quite nice and don't bother them. We did. We did pleasant, but ah, they had like they knew nothing but, but she chose. 
people had to be resilient. If you got a day's work, then you made that your priority. You got the day's work, which meant then that your family could eat. And you knew to get a job, you were going to have to be very, very lucky. And when I got the job in the root house, that was probably half my delight. Would you agree with an extra hour's drinking in the pubs on a Sunday night? I think they should be open all night. All night long? All night long, yeah. 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 I agree with drinking all the time. <laughs> As a matter for that, I think they'll that. drink any time. Yeah. You know, you, no matter what hours are open or not open, you're going to get people going to the pubs. Would I agree with the extra hour's drinking? No, I don't. Why not? Well, I think, first of all, there's enough time for drink. There's too much money spent on drink. At that time, not, not just where I was reared in the Brandywell, but most of the, which would be known as the city side areas, like the bog side, like the Brandywell, Bishop Street and all around there, there was just no work available at all. Probably at that time, the only work really was the docks, and if you didn't get it in the docks, you weren't going to get it. You had all these men who were out every day looking for work, but knowing that there wasn't going to be any jobs. Meanwhile, their wives and daughters were in the factories, which was the only real work in Derry. But at the same time, if a man's at home all day and he's written and his wife or his daughter's coming home with a pay packet, it's just not the way for a man to have any kind of feelings about being a member of a family. He's just there. He's not contributing anything. And to me, that was a lot to do with a lot of men actually get into drinking. It wasn't because they had money, it was simply because the lack of self-esteem, that they never felt they were really men as in going out and being the breadwinners. And I believe that had a lot to do with the culture of Ireland drinking. Not just in Derry, but I think no matter where you go, you go to Cork, you go to Ireland, and say, oh, the Irish can drink, the Irish can drink. Of course they could drink. There was nothing else for them to do. They, they left themselves. Now what do you think I've been doing all day? Boozing, bloody well boozing. How do you think I've been spending me pay? Boozing, bloody well boozing. Don't say I am wrong, for you know I'm not right. Don't argue the pints, for you know I can't fight. But where would you like me to take in tonight? Boozing, bloody well boozing. You want shield. I don't want people in there without shields. I do not want people in there without shields. Some regrettable things happen, but that should not at any time be allowed to obscure the essential point that the rage and the discontent which is being expressed at the moment in the bog site and in other areas is quite understandable and, in my opinion, justifiable, if not perhaps tactically correct in certain senses at the moment. There was too much going on for people not to have the need to congregate around and talk about the day or the week or the event that's been happening, say, from the late 60s. Joe would have grew up through all out there, and uh, the bar would definitely been a haven for people. They sort of run there when they, they could afford to do it. And discuss, because people had to discuss, you just couldn't keep what was happening in your life quiet. They were getting there for companionship, knowing that everybody else was in the same boat. So everybody understood where you were at, and all you were trying to do was to get the day in. Now, I've spent times in bars when things were not good in Derry and bombs happened and everything else. Back in 1976, I was managing a bar called the Alleyman's Bar in Strand Road. We got a telephone call, they said there was a bomb in the building. We got them all out, we phoned the army and the army and the police came. The next thing is, this colonel boy came up to me and he says, oh, we're going to send a bomb expert in. And they brought up this jumper who couldn't have been any more than 21 or 22 years of age. He looked like a young fella 15. I says, that's only a young fella. He says, that's all we have. I said, well, what did I tell you? I'm getting home. Whenever that bar was cleared, now, there was maybe a hundred people standing in the Strand Road, but I knew whenever we come out, if he cleared it, that they were going to go back in again for a drink. They weren't going home on a Saturday night at 10 o'clock. And whenever I come out, I says, look, folks, 
you know, do you want to just leave it, look, and, you know, we'll... Oh, not at all, Joe, he says, no, no, he says, we, we invited friends all up. He says, no, we're getting in for a drink. And whenever they get in, they are all sitting hugging one another. And do you know what it was? It was like their home hadn't been blew up. That's the way it was. That's the kind of friendship. But that's how close they were. We're not letting this boy we're night. We're all friends here. I used to have a competition this early night for two steaks for the Sunday dinner. See the two boys who were in the final? They insisted in playing the final. And one boy says, to her, no, I'll tell you what, Andy says, you take it with you, says. Because he was still afraid there was a bomb in the bar. Andy didn't care. Andy had never won the stakes, and he was supposed to be the best earth to were in the alley match. He just wanted he won the stakes. He took them down, and he said to his wife, look, I won the stakes for the master. That's the kind of thing that happens over years with friendships and bars. Because you get this feeling that these aren't just my drinking buddies. These are my family. There's a beautiful city that stands by the foil And that goes by the name of London Derry It is famous for sure to make us all of your nose Just as well as for brandy and sherry they're vest makers, dress makers, milliners too. The shop girls and pop girls so airy. But the pets of them all I am bound to recall. And the factory girls of London Dairy. London Dairy. My love of music actually started from a way back when I was five, but I found that it didn't seem to have any real niche. I would be buying like rock one week and the next week it might be pop and the next week it might be country. Whenever I first went to Weddingham's, we, we didn't have any music at all. And to be honest, I, I, I just sort of didn't really know how I was going to get it started. Weddingham's too? Are you serious? Joe still praises me to the end. He always says it was me, but 100% him. He says, if I get you on here, We'll make a go at this bar. He gave everybody a chance. It didn't matter what type of music it was. Joe would give you a chance. See, especially if you were local. To renew, I cursed all foreign money. No credit could I gain. It's filled my heart with longing for the lakes of Punta Train. You had the Henry sisters. Eamon Freed would have been on, Gay McIntyre, I could go on for ages. Once the music took off, the bar took off. Music's one language. Everybody knows the same language. Once music starts, it doesn't matter what type of music you're into. If you're into music and you hear music in a bar, it loves you. It brings people together. He would have done anything for you. You know, if you had a system, would you come and do such and such? You know, are you free to do away something for me? Oh, no bother. The generosity of Joe. Sometimes Joe got, is over generous to a fault. I, I had a fight with him for about two years to get him to let me pay for a pint. It's things like uh, going to pay bands the other night. Joe, Joe would have slept in an extra tenner. Do you know what I mean? And you're thinking to yourself, happy days, nobody else does this. But the main thing he did do in here he started off a thing called Bennigan's Baby. It was a charity, and it was to take the children off the streets of India. Joe went to India himself. There's a big jar sitting up at the counter, and it was never empty. You can give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. You give him a fishing rod, you feed him for life. And that's what we felt. For these children, do you have any chance of an education? Do you have any kind of life to get out of the poverty that they were in? And the kind of Joe, Joe would have bought something to raffle, and I'm not, I say a microwave, but Joe would have bid for it himself and paid more money than he did when he bought the microwave in the first place. He used to buy it back, you know, and that's, that's Joe Nillis. For every bad day I had in a bar, I had 200 good days days that I went home at night and thought, you know what, 
I love this job. I love the people. I love watching people enjoying themselves. But over the years, I've seen thousands of people. I've been to hundreds of weddings where people who met in my bar and get married. I'm God for it, about 26 children in Derry. That to me is a kind of thing that's special. And that's the kind of chance you get to meet people, all kinds of people, in a bar. Whenever I look back now and think, you know what, I really was lucky. But I loved it. I loved every single day of it.